Perfect, thank you. So yeah, uh, it's a fairly geological talk. So it's about mid Middle East and Early Miocene, absolute paleolithic and not Islam. First of all, um, so figure out. Yeah. So this was my problem in the morning. It was I was not chickening out from my talk, so I did have a problem with my router. As you can see, when this red light is on, it's not good. Anyway. So first of all, what is Zealandia, Northern Zealandia especially, is a this big chunk of uh, continental crust in the mostly submerged under the water of the Southwest Pacific Ocean. So let's say between New Zealand and New Caledonia. And it's separated from Australia by the Tasman Sea Basin. And there was an expedition, an IODP expedition in 2017. And the idea behind the expedition was mostly tectonic in nature because there is the Pacific plate is subducting beneath the Tonga Kermadec arc, but how this, all this area evolved through time is not clear and it's still under the light of the inspection right now. And it has implication also for the paleoclimate, for example, because like the Cenozoic, especially the Eocene, but also the time that follows, has a very interesting climate history with warming and cooling and hyperthermals. And the long-term trend of the climate is very likely modulated by this large-scale tectonic event. So the beginning of the subduction of the Pacific plate on the, the Mariana Trench, let's say, and the Isobonin, um, so Japan and this part of the world. So there were a number of sites, and today I'm going to talk about two sites because they had the, the best paleomagnetic record. One is 1507, which is drilled here in the New Caledonia Trough, very deep. The sediments have been deposited uh, above the carbon and compensation there, so it's mostly chalk with some clay and volcanic material on top and pure chalk in the bottom. And I'm not talking about who, so this is chalk that you can uh, trim with a saw. So it's very good for polymagnetic analysis because it's very consistent material. While the other side is 1511, uh, it was deposited during the, below the carbonic composition there. So the part that is of interest for us is this one, the upper part. And it's diatomite, so no carbonate, but it's a very good polymagnetic signal as well. So, for uh, correlating this sediment with the geomagnetic polarity time scale, we use the, okay, the all data that have been acquired, sorry, being acquired on board together with um, a lot of samples that we collect in the sampling part. So, the blue samples have been demagnetized with AF demagnetization. So most of the sample in 1507 have been AF demagnetized, but the red one also with thermal. So there was a kind of pilot phase where we did both, uh, but AF was efficient in, efficient in this side. In this other side, we noticed that in the lower part, especially there was some hematite. So we decided to go for thermal for all the samples that we collected in the sampling party. And thermal was also very efficient, even if there was no sign of magnetization carried by hematite in the upper part. So some uh, vector hand point demagnetization diagrams. So the, the first four, this one, this one, this one, this one comes from the 1507. The quality is definitely high in the upper part and is parallel with the intensity of the magnetization. Then you have the intensity drop, a couple of order of magnitudes and the quality decreases a bit, but they're still very good direction. And we, have, we do have very good direction also from the diatomite. And we can see that in the very lower part, just in the very last few 10 meters, the magnetization is carried by hematite. But the rest is very likely magnetized. So there's probably also a problem with the furnace here. So it's not very well calibrated, I suppose, but there's no, uh, there's no hematite, I would say. Or if there is hematite, the magnetization is carried by magnetite. So why are we doing that? because, so we decided very good direction, we can use them in terms of paleogeography, not just magnetostatigraphy. The thing is that if you take this all time interval, so from the Middle Eocene to the early Miocene, so there are 30 million of years of history, there's not that many paleomagnetic poles available. And most of them are coming from North America. And these eight poles they collected from Australia are actually not included in the compilation. So, if, for example, if you look at the upper polar one, the pair of torsi, there's no these poles here. And they are mostly oligocene, as far as I remember. And 
the thing is that one could say, yeah, there's enough data. I mean, the relative motion between the plates very well known, but it's also true that the absolute paleo latitude as a, a lot of implication, for example, for paleogeography, of course, and climate modeling. So there's people that are working consistently on paleoclimate modeling in the EOC. And if you use a paleogeography as a base for your models, there is not, is deviated the paleo latitude, even of five or 10 degrees. That creates a lot of problems. You have data, proxy data, and climate models that are not consistent within each other. So, one of the problems that you have working with sediment is the inclination flattening, of course. We don't expect to have a strong inclination flattening in these sediments because they are ODP sediments, so they are not, uh, the compaction is very low. Uh, but still, there may be some, especially if you have hematite. So for anyone who's not familiar, the inclination flattening, this is the inclination that you measure. This is the inclination, uh, the original one. And you can have a flattening, which is uh, mathematically represented by this uh, tangent function with f that can range from zero, completely flattened it to one, no flattening. We tried several, uh, some methods uh, that are described in the literature. Uh, there's no time right now, but they were not really working this. So I decided to go for another way that I decided myself. So what I did is uh, apply an ARM along the three direction, one at a time, of course. And bef uh, before I applied the next one, I was demagnetizing the sample using the same steps that I use for the, um, for the demagnetization of the direction. This is for site 1507, where we apply mostly um, AF demagnetization. So if this is the tensor of the anisotropy of the anesthetic demagnetization, then we can determine the inclination flattening by applying this equation. So the magnetization along this acid axis versus the two long axis. And experimentally, what I did yes, was just put in a, a, a high number of samples, which we did after uh, measuring the, the anisotropy in this like three axis way and demagnetizing the anisotropy itself. And the data along the two horizontal axes were systematically overlapping, so virtually the same. In this figure, I just added, I calculate, I averaged them, but they are absolutely the same. And then I was calculating the potential, the flattening of the direction for each step and averaging it. It's, all, it's always the same, so it's within the error, so for each step. And we can see this, if you're familiar with inclination of flattening of sediments, this quite normal for carbonates. And especially for the upper part, because they have more clay, the lower part is definitely lower, the flattening. And it's, uh, it's okay, it's consistent with the presence of only carbonate. For the site 1511, that we use only thermal, we apply different methods. The material is not enough. So I was taking a cube, I modified, uh, a method used by Dario Bilatel and published 2015. So each cube has been cut in a number of like eight cubes, smaller cubes, and then oriented in a way that I will apply a pulse field and then the magnetizing thermally the samples and calculate the, same, the tensor in a very similar way. Now these sediments, the porosity is so high, is at more than 80%, 70-80%. So there's really no inclination flattening expected. There was some calculated, very, very little, and especially was a bit higher in the lower part, but also the thermal demagnetization diagram tell us that there is hematite. So summarizing all the results, we have all the direction, the direction that are correct for inclination flattening. These are all the inclination flattening calculation. And uh, I didn't request sample at the time here, so I'm still working on that. So I use also the shipboard data to help our correlation. So in the end, we have, we have a nice set of direction of, uh, yeah, paleomagnetic poles that are correlated with the, uh, with the geomagnetic polarity time scale. So if we plot them in terms of, uh, of course, we don't have the, the declination, cores are unoriented, so we have kind of belt. But it's interesting, the interesting thing is that they perfectly match the, the direction from the literature. So there is a very good agreement 
with the literature, data from the literature, even if there are not many, and our data corrected for information sharing. And uh, the only thing is that one can see that we are, so Australia in, at the time was migrating. So you would expect to have the inclination decreasing constantly and not doing this kind of jump. So that was already a bit puzzling me. But then what we did was comparing our data with one of the most recent the absolute plate motion model. So uh, those models that include basically all the geodynamic data. So the, the relative motion between the plates anchored to the mantle through the, um, the hotspot tracks and then to the um, spin axis through the paleomagnetism. And they are the palo latitude determined from the model, they're systematically lower, but they kind of fall within uh, our um, calculation, except for the, um, for the late year scene. But what you also see is that if you take the global polymagnetic poles using the model and you plot them in a, and you plot the polymagnetic pole, this is supposed to fall on, if the model was perfectly anchored with the spin axis, it's supposed to fall on the south pole and it doesn't. So what is the problem here? So this is very likely due to the true polar wonder. So true polar wonder for anyone who's not familiar is where the old mantle is just rotating compared uh, to the spin axis. So the spin axis never change. So it's like, you can imagine having a ball, a plastic ball that is rotating if you in the space. And if you put a coin somewhere on this ball, the coin will tend to go to the equator, but the spin axis doesn't change. And that's uh, something that is occurring even now for the like uh, all the all the glacier the glaciers that melted in North America and created a kind of mantle rebound is a very uh, subtle but existing uh, true polar wonder. And it's some something in the past was um, especially when you have big geologic phenomena, you can have a big true polar wonder event. But it's always underestimated for the Cenozoic, also in this model. But if you calculate actually the true polar wonder using the data published in the literature, so the global upper polar wonder part, and for example, this uh, geodynamic model, plate motion model, which is anchored to the mantle through the hotspots, you can see that you can determine um, a true polar wonder existing. So eventually we came out with this figure where there are the data, our data. Uh, our data together with the published data. So we put all the data together and, and we can see the, the motion of the two sites through times. And the red line is the, um, is basically the motion predicted by the absolute plane motion, plane motion model. And you can use actually also the paleolatitude.org website to calculate the polylatitude, which is this dotted line and it's more consistent with our uh, data, but it cal it's averaging out the data every 10 million of years. So it's not very precise. So in the end, if you want to calculate uh, a real and consistent and precise polygeography, you have to do it yourself using a plate motion model and having the available polymagnetic data and putting them in the pole. So final remarks, we have five um, paleo, absolute paleo latitude estimations for Northern Zealandia. And they help a lot because there's really no, very little data in the area for that. They have very good agreement with the existing data. If there are not many, and they're coming mostly from North America. And we, uh, we wanna point out that a paleomagnetic reference frame, so a paleogeographic frame that is anchoring the plates with the spin axis is always preferable to the, for example, other frame that uh, are uh, anchoring the plates with the mantle, like the hotspot frame, especially when you run paleoclimate palo model. There are significant implications. You can find many papers in the past. I didn't put any reference, sorry for that, but there are papers in the past where they are using. Uh, um, a mantle frame, and you can see the palo latitude is not correct, and they have problems matching the proxy data together with the results from the model. 
And by the way, our inclination flattening method seems to work out well. Okay, that's it. Great, thank you very much. Um, we do have a question in the chat for you. Um, what was the reason or composition for having only a small level offset from drilling effect in your samples? Your samples remnants recovery and your correlation with the pole position was quite good. I'm not sure I understand the question for our small level offset. So. Gunther, do you want to uh, talk on the mic for a moment, maybe? Well, uh, yeah, please. You were saying that uh, um, normally there is a drilling effect because when you drill the core, uh, you have this uh, drilling feature that sometimes it's difficult to get rid of. Yes, yeah, sure. In your case, you did quite well. And how, how did you do this? How did because, you do this? because the lithology is perfect. It was really short. I'm telling you, the first, we started sampling uh, coring with APC. And we we're getting horrible cores. At one point, we decided to go for rotary. Which is all good old rotary. There's just like green in the sediment now, grind in the sediment now, and it worked perfectly because the the rocks were slightly lithified, and that is perfect for. There was like the recovery is very high, surprisingly high, especially for the sinus you know, for the ears in part, and the quality was so high. So we could literally take the cores and trim them with the saw, and having perfect cubes. So there is no current disturbance. If there is some, there is really minimal. So, because so, I didn't show the data, but if you look at the anisotropy data, they are perfectly sedimentary. So, so is the degree of lithification you think is the main yeah. reason? Yes, absolutely. 